Tagrave is a sci-fi wargame system written by the author of Frostgrave. Frostgrave is a skirmish level wargame about wizards and their warbands fighting for treasures and Stargrave is a skirmish level wargame about space captains and their gangs fighting for loot. In this video I take an in-depth look at the Stargrave rulebook. My name is Shonku and you are watching Eastwind. The Stargrave book is a lightweight one, both regarding rules and background lore. The in-universe background is that after the last war there are no strong central authorities left in the galaxy, but just disorder and chaos everywhere, an environment where adventuring mercenary bands can thrive. And I pretty much explained all the lore. As you can guess, you will play as one of those mercenary bands. The game calls itself a narrative one, which is more about the story and the fun of the games than a competitive experience. Tactical depth is missing on purpose, at least that is the pretense. There are a few natural comparisons for this system. Necromanda, Warhammer 40k Kill Team and Space Hulk what comes to mind first. The style of the book itself is also pretty clear. The term lean comes to mind. There are no lengthy lore segments or text boxes with fancy graphics. The illustrations in the book are either paintings of some well-known sci-fi tropes such as robots, grizzled space soldiers or aliens, or pictures of miniatures and scenery tables. The book is easy to read and I really like the illustrations. They evoked kind of an old school sci-fi atmosphere. The typography itself is well thought out, there are no contrasting text and background colors, it isn't too dark or bright. Let's talk about the scale of the game. As I mentioned, it is skirmish level, you command individuals, not armies. This is enforced by the game's 10 member in limit on your team. That's it, you can't have more than two characters and eight dudes, dudettes or whatever the blorks call themselves nowadays. As for the scale of the minis themselves, the rules were written with the popular 28mm scale in mind, but you can use any scale as long as your opponent does too. You might want to modify some of the rules for that though. There is an official line of miniatures, but the book says use whatever you have available. I really have to comment the author on this, as the book is not written with miniature sales in mind. I would completely understand if it contains some push for the official merchandise, but the full book has only one link in it. I'm not even sure that the pictures in the book are of official miniatures. There are no restrictions about what type of models you can use, and this is true in the most literal sense. You don't need to use human or even humanoid figures. If you want to play with a gang of sentient blobs, just go for it. We'll also need some loot tokens and of course scenery and terrain. But we all know from our kitchen table wargaming days that this is not a high bar to clear. The book literally says just get some wooden blocks to start. For the game rolls a 20 sided die is used which is not too hard or expensive to obtain in this day and age. The game uses inches as the unit of measurement. Generally I like that as not only basically 90% of gaming minis are built with that in mind but it is just fine grained enough. Similarly to other skirmish games, campaign play is encouraged and there is a progression system for that. It is also recommended that you invent a backstory for your team, such as treasure hunters, a grizzled war veterans or a bunch of cannibalistic milkmen who went sour after a botch delivery. Your crew must contain a captain and a first mate similar to Frostgrave's wizard and apprentice mechanics. All the other dudes are referred to as soldiers and have more limited options in game. Your captain must choose a background which modifies its base stats and have a set of core powers. Backgrounds are based on some well-known tropes such as cyborg, rogue, biomorph and so on with their thematic powers attached. After this section you get a brief introduction to the stats which are move, fight, shoot, armor with the British spelling nonetheless, will and health. These are pretty much what you expect. You also need to create a first mate for your crew which is similar to your captain but with slightly worse stats and fewer powers. Also, your captain has 6 inventory slots, while your exo only gets 5. I guess he doesn't even lift. Your captain starts at level 15 and the minimi starts at level 0. After this, you get some credits to recruit your soldiers. You can get up to 8 of those, 4 of which can be specialists. The main difference between them is equipment. Some of them are free to recruit, meaning even if you are broke, you still have a bunch of leads on your side, just like it isn't in real life. Let's have a quick rundown of the soldier types. Recruits are free, they have a knife, a pistol and a light armor. Runners are faster but have no armor and shoot a bit worse. Hackers are even worse but they have a hacking device called a deck. At least they have armor. Chiselers are similar but instead of a deck they have something called a pick which at this point you have no idea what it is. But it's probably useful and not related to mining. Guard dogs are fast, 
but not much else and can't carry items. Sentries are your first heavier choice, with a carbine, a heavy armor and something called a hand weapon, again a weird naming choice. Troopers have heavy armor, a knife, a carbine and are a bit better at shooting. Medics have a pistol, light armor and a medic kit which can probably heal your soldiers. We don't know at this point. That's it for the basic troops, let's look at the specialists. A codebreaker is a better hacker and a case cracker is a better chiseler. They also carry carbines now. Commandos are your chads, being good both in melee and ranged combat. They carry carbines and grenades. Pathfinders are lighter armored but faster commandos. Snipers have real good shooting, light armor and a carbine but also a hand weapon. Grenadiers have grenade launchers and burners have flamethrowers. They both are in heavy armor and carry pistols as backup weapons. A gunner is someone with commando stats carrying a rapid fire because calling it a machine gun would be so 20th century. Armor troopers are your final entry in this list and they are the Giga Chads of Stargrave, having the best stats all around except for movement and dressed in combat armor. There are no big differences between stat lines here, generally the difference to the baseline being 3 in most cases. The guard dog is a bit of an outlier here, having a really bad willpower. I'm sure despite all of this he is a very good boy. Since the game uses a d20, a 3 point difference tips the scale 15% one way or the other. This is noticeable, but not overwhelming. This is a recurring theme from Frostgrave, where your soldiers are more like disposable henchmen than named characters, and your captain and Dixo are the main characters here. Soldiers can carry only one item, and they can't change their basic equipment, with the exception of advanced versions of their gear. So a trooper can't have a pistol, but he can upgrade his carbine to a murder kill dead gun 8000. Upon recruitment you can choose any soldier to be a robot. This has no effect on their stat lines or equipment, but some rules work differently on them. Some powers can only work on robots, or can only target non-robots. The captain and first mate cannot be robots. After this section there is a basic equipment list. A deck adds a bonus to open data loot and a pick is apparently a toolkit that does the same for physical loot. A medic kit can't heal HP on your soldiers but it can remove status effects. It doesn't run out and there is no limit how many times it can be used on a soldier. A filter mask protects you from harmful gases and low oxygen levels. I guess it filters the vacuum to be breathable, don't question it, it's science. And these are all the inventory type items and we continue on with the weapons. In melee, if you are unarmed you get penalties to hit and damage. Less so with a knife and a hand weapon which is any weapon specifically made for hand to hand combat such as a rapier, a chainsword or a sock field with beans has no penalties. Pistols are small and have one damage while carbines shoot further and make stuff deader. Shotguns have a shorter range but higher damage and a bonus to hit. You can trade a carbine for a shotgun on any soldier and vice versa. I think this could have been included in the soldier charts as well, but it is not a big issue. A rapid fire, which to be honest should be called a Maschinengewehr 42, can fire twice in one action, even at two targets close to each other. However, it takes three inventory slots, so Hans won't be carrying anything else. There are two types of grenades in the game, fragmentation and smoke. A frag grenade damages everything in a one and a half inch radius, and the smoke creates a larger radius of well, smoke that blocks line of sight. A grenade launcher fires grenades further away, but it has a negative modifier to hit. Flamethrowers use the usual tetrop shaped template. They also have a good damage bonus and ignore light and heavy armor. Combat armor still applies but even cover is negated somewhat. These are all the weapons available in the game. Clearly the aim was just to lay down some basic types, not to fill the weapon list with lupus pattern wolf guns with attached woofer type popper launchers. All the template weapons have their templates included in the book for your photocopying needs. As for armors, you have the heavy, light and combat armor. Light armor is basically good for keeping your guts in, less so in keeping the bullets out. Heavy armors add one extra layer of cardboard on top of that and combat armors double that bonus. Combat armors have also a pistol, a hand weapon and a filter mask integrated. They also cost you 50 bucks to field and that is per game. Can't help but imagine a coin slot on them that you have to put quarters in before every battle. You can have up to 4 specialists and your leaders can also wear combat armor, so it can add up quickly. I recommend calling that gang the Rand Seekers. After the equipment section in the book there is the chapter with the rules. It starts out with rules about how to set up the gaming table emphasizing the role of a lot of terrain. After setting up you need to place loot tokens which are mostly the main objective of battles. A turn in Stargrave is divided into 4 phases. Captain, first mate, soldier and creature phase. 
Each player activates in each phase, then repeats that in the next phase. In the Captain and First Mate phases, you activate the titular characters and the number of soldiers in close proximity. In the Soldier phase you activate your remaining grants and in the Creature phase the unaligned monsters on the table act, mostly according to some rules. Not all creatures are aggressive by default. During an activation you get two actions, one of which must be usually a move action. Stat rolls are also explained in this section. Basically you roll a d20 with modifiers against the target number, with a natural 20 and a natural 1 being an auto success and auto failure. Movement is pretty straightforward, you can move your movement stat in inches with rough terrain, climbing etc. costing a bit more. You can't move closer than 1 inch to an enemy figure, except for close combat. Nothing new if you ever played Warhammer. There are also rules here for jumping, falling and swimming. After this there is the combat section, which I think should be called close combat to avoid confusion. Close combat is a contested role. Whoever rolls a higher total inflicts damage on the loser, mitigated by armor. It is important to note that the damage is the total roll, not the difference. On an equal roll, both participants take damage. After damage the winner can decide to remain in combat, push back the enemy or pull back one inch itself. If there is no winner, they remain in combat. There are some detailed rules for combats with more than two participants with a lot of detailed examples. I have to award one good boy point here, as the author really strived to give a clear overview on this with understandable clear language and considering edge cases, not to mention visual aids for helping understanding. Following this, the shooting is detailed. Interestingly, it is also a contested role with the attacker's shooting stat against the defender's fight stat. This is a key difference to most GW systems, as it is not only dependent on the attacker. This also means that shooting is a bit less effective or predictable. Enemy figures do block line of sight, so you can only shoot at the first space goblin in a row of identical space goblins. And to be that guy for a second, this also means that you can model to win here. The best approach is have a solid block of amoeboid creatures as your model, as it blocks the most line of sight. Alternatively, you can say that your crew is a race of sentient earthworms and 1mm tall on a base, so they are basically always in cover. Now I don't advocate for this of course, but I see this as a possible downside for being able to use literally any model. As a resolution, I would say let's agree that line of sight is entirely decided by the bases, which we agreed to have a standard size of. Or maybe you can just not play with assholes. Anyway, back to the review. You can shoot into close combat, but it is randomly determined who gets hit, making it risky. Recruit Jenkins might die, but it's a sacrifice I'm willing to make. With grenades you target a point on the table and roll against a fixed number. You don't actually need line of sight for this, but the grenade needs to be able to get there. So you can throw a grenade over a wall, but not into a closed building. Upon a miss it scatters, then everything is damaged under a template. The book also gives you a cool way to determine a random direction using a d20, which I won't spoil since it is literally impossible to figure out. Personally I recommend spinning a bottle of vodka to determine scatter and drinking it after a game. I recommend this for multitude of reasons. Rolls of a natural 1 and 20 matter in shooting too, as you can get a bonus to damage or a weapon jam with them. That's the extent of weapon mechanics. You don't have to deal with unstable weapons, random number of shots etc. and there is no ammo rules. There are three conditions your crew can suffer from. Wounded if you are below 4 hit points, stun if you received a big hit, and toxin which is triggered by environmental effects or powers. Robots don't suffer from toxin and wounded conditions. This section is followed by rules regarding activating powers, but I'll detail those later. After this we come to the rules regarding loot tokens. There are data loot and physical loot tokens. You must unlock a token using a willpower check before being able to carry it off. There are some equipment pieces that help out with this. A loot token is not safe until you carried it off the table. Until then the carrier can be killed or a power can cause it to drop the loot. Loot tokens have no use during the battle. Chapter 3 deals with campaigns, another core element of the game. Stargrave is clearly written with campaign play in mind and it shows. First injuries. After a game your injured crew members roll to see how bad is the damage, it is just dead slash wounded slash fine for soldiers, but a bit more detailed for your characters. You can lose gear or get a permanent injury. Multiple permanent injuries can kill your characters outright. After the injury section there is the XP and loot distribution rules. It is important to note that experience is an attribute of the crew, not the captain or the first mate. You can gain a maximum of 300 experience per game. You can buy levels for your characters for 100 XP, but you are not obligated 
get it to do so. Maybe you want to kill off your old and injured captain and get a new one before cashing in your hoarded XP. There is literally nothing else to spend experience on. Every level costs 100 XP and advancements are determined by the level number, such as at level 1, 11, 21, etc. you get to lower an activation number. Pretty streamlined, more XP is more gooder. Loot is another integral part of this game and we get to that section now. After a game you roll for each loot token acquired by your crew, there are separate tables for data and physical loot. You can get credits, information that you can either sell or trade for XP, trade goods that you can sell, advanced weapons, advanced technologies, alien artifacts and secrets which either help you during the next game or can be sold outright. Advanced weapons are just that, weapons with extra damage, range, stat bonus or taking up fewer gear slots. Anyone who can use a basic version can use the advanced one. There are 40 distinct pieces of advanced technology, many of them are consumables, getting destroyed after one or a few uses. There are advanced armors, decks and picks. Sadly, even the technology of the future can't combine those two, so you can't just send deck picks everywhere. Basic shields have no use in the game, but advanced versions do. For instance, they can protect you against shooting. There are items aiding movement or negating some kind of terrain effects, such as a kill suit or a grapple gun. Few items give outright bonuses and even then the bonuses themselves are small. Equipment seems to be centered more around utility. There are also very few items that heal and they don't heal too much, either 1 point per turn or 4 points but only once. Although the wording here can be interpreted a bit different, but I think the intent was it to be a one-use item. You can also have a plasma blaster and let's be honest, whatever that does, it's cool to have one. Certain technologies can improve your powers, making them easier to cast or reducing strain. Most of these are focused on robot-based powers or thematically more engineering focused ones. One such example is electromagnetic pulse. Alien artifacts are the next category. They are seemingly a higher value class of loot, even just by looking at their costs. Rightfully so, as they give bonuses to various powers, sometimes allowing them to be activated for free. Since strain is unblockable damage when using powers, there is a huge difference between 0 and 1 strain. Power enhancing artifacts usually can be used only once per game, but they are not destroyed after. You can't just outright buy advanced weapons, advanced technologies and alien artifacts. You get to roll one dice per table and you can buy that one particular item if you wish. You can always sell anything though, generally for half or less of the buying price. Equipment is not the only thing that you can buy. Cheap improvements are persistent bonuses that can be used in, after or during any battle. For example, a robotics workshop gives you some bonuses on activating robot-related powers and a weapon locker allows you to give one soldier a better weapon before a game. By a cursory glance, I'd say it is worth prioritizing these. Buying equipment is subject to randomness, but cheap upgrades are not. Also, the bonuses given are pretty decent. Finally, the chapter concludes with a small text box advising to give rerolls to lower level crews in games. This is just a small bonus to the underdog and will not give you easy wins. And this sums up the basic rules. Next, let's take a look at the powers, which are a big part of the game, not unlike spells in Frostgrave. Activating powers also work similarly in both games. You get an activation difficulty, which is a target number you have to roll against on a d20. You get a bonus on this roll to your core powers, and later you can improve that number further by a spending experience points. If you roll below the required number, you can spend health points to make up the difference. A risky proposition, but if you miss only one or two points, it might be well worth it. You get a tiny 3 inch free move called a power move when you activate a power. It might be just enough to duck behind cover. Powers seem to be designed in a fire and forget manner. You can turn them off after activation. Unless stated otherwise, there is no limit how many times you can use one power or how many times you can target a specific model with it. You can activate powers in and into close combat, though you may hit friendly models in the latter case. Some powers have something called strain, which I mentioned before, which is unmitigated damage to the caster after successfully using the power. For certain powers, armor also gives a negative modifier. This is called armor interference. Not all powers are to be used in the tabletop, some are activated before or after the game. You can only do this once per power per character. Repeat or a reference to the exertion rules would have been welcome in this chapter. Really just as a quality of life improvement. A note on strain and exertion. You cannot activate a power if the strain or exertion damage would take the user to 0 HP or below. Powers are a fun and integral part of the game and there are a lot of them. It is quite a challenge to plan for every outcome with them. I decided to do a detailed rundown on them with some brainstorming on their tactical usage. Let's get into it. First we have Adrenaline Surge. 
This gives you another action in this turn and in the next, but it has two strain. I would say it generally seems like a good trade, especially when you have health to spare. You can only cast it on yourself, but it is still good. Anti-gravity projection gives someone levitation, basically ignoring hard terrain. It lasts until the end of the game and it has no strain or limits on how many dudes can levitate, so your dream of a hovercat squadron is just a step away. Next up is armor plates. Two strain, self only and it gives you plus two armor, except if you are wearing combat armor. You start with nine armor on the captain and the first mate and the maximum armor you can have in the game is 14, so at most you are gonna cast this three times. It doesn't sound bad but falls short of your dreams of becoming big chongus. Can be used before combat though and I'd rather take armor instead of health in most cases. This is also the first power that doesn't feel like space magic but some kind of tinkering, just putting that out there. Coming up something called armory. An out of game power that lets you either field a combat armor for free or give certain ranged weapons plus one damage. Since it is effectively one use, it feels like just a small bonus. Next, we have bait and switch. The caster yanks a loot token from a figure, then moves the token. Interestingly, it doesn't specify that your target must be an enemy soldier, but I assume friendly still need a roll to resist. This has two strain though, which makes it seem a bit costly. With break lock, you unlock a physical loot token within line of sight. Only one strain and might save you some time. Bribe is an out of game power that creates a bribe token if successful. This can be used to bribe an enemy soldier, making it automatically miss a shooting attack before rolling anything and it is only once per game. Honestly, this is pretty meh, considering it is pretty hard to activate and shooting isn't that rare. Even with a miss after seeing a roll, this would be mediocre. Up next we have Camouflage. The enemy cannot draw line of sight to this figure if it is more than 12 inches away. Note that this doesn't mean it cannot be targeted by any means, some effects don't require line of sight and grenade and flamethrower templates are a thing. Still, this is pretty great, even with two strain it really enhances your survivability. It is cancelled when you are stunned though. With this you can and effectively outrange your opponent in many cases. I would definitely recommend it. Cancel power is basically a counter spell against any line of sight power. Since you can't cancel most of your own powers voluntarily, this can be used to recover from some unintended side effects. For example, placing a line of sight blocking wall that now benefits your enemy. This also mitigates unseen risks, so I would say if you are trying to be a generalist, pick this. It is a bit hard to activate and has one strain. Interestingly, the cancellation is not dependent of the enemy power strengths. It's a pretty solid choice all around. Command activates a crew member immediately. Since the captain and first mate phase is before the soldier phase, this can speed up your loot running or get a critical shot slash template in earlier. This is a choice that offers a lot of tactical flexibility, thus making it generally useful. Concealed firearm. If you are in close combat, you can make a shooting attack with a plus 5 bonus for one strain. If successful, it knocks back and stuns your enemy automatically. To be honest, this feels a bit lackluster. You must succeed on two rolls, one of them contested to successfully use this and that most with a plus 3 compared to your base stats. The knockback and stun combo is the saving grace here, I guess this can be used to remove dangerous enemies from melee. Some monsters can deal double or even triple damage where this might come in handy. Otherwise I would just make a close combat attack. With all this being said, it feels very situational. Control animal, you can acquire Chonkosaurus. Situational but a free crew member for a battle is nothing to sneeze at. You can only have one animal per activator under your command this way, so a maximum of two. It only works on uncontrolled animals so you can just steal yourself some host style dog goes sorry. It has one strain which seems like a good trade. Control robot is same as the previous just with robots, aka possible enemy crew members. While the controlled robot can attempt to resist this every turn, this can be game changing. It is also subject to the one per caster limit, still very much worth it. You can also steal back your own robots. Coordinated fire. This gives plus one to shooting on a figure for the rest of the game. Can stack it, but you can give it to everyone and there is no strain involved. So buffing up your entire crew is very much an option. I'd call it a solid choice. Next, create robot. Why steal a robot when you can just create one? You can roll to get any crew member for free except armor troopers. You get to keep it after the battle too. You still can't have more than 8 soldiers and 4 of them specialists. This power feels very strong at first glance, but consider the following points. First, the new crew members are always robots. This is not without advantages, but it can backfire. Second, the power may or may not work, so you can't rely on having a new member. Third, I flip through the book and rules as written you cannot recruit if you have a full complement of soldiers. 
What does this mean? You can just roll and decide to replace your weakest member with an advanced one, since this is an out of game action and normal recruiting just precedes it. I know this is nitpicking, but between two competitively minded players this can be a point of disagreement. Finally this power has a slightly higher activation number, so you actually have to roll well here. The target number is 14 and you can have a plus 2 at maximum on activating a power when starting out meaning that you need to roll a 12 or higher, so this power will work 40% of the time, at least for a starting crew. Bearing all this in mind, for a starting crew I would rate this power as not great, not terrible. Later, when you get better at using it, it might be more useful. After this, we have the first truly offensive power called Dark Energy. You can make a shooting attack with a large bonus that is even larger versus robots that ignores armor. You can also shoot into close combat without randomizing the target. It has one strain and an average activation difficulty. Seems pretty good, especially with ignoring armor. The drawback is the 12 inch range and it does have armor interference, but it can potentially one-shot an enemy soldier. Coming up, Data Jump. You can transfer a data loot token between your crew members to a maximum distance of 8 inches. No strain and average difficulty and you can pretty much get a free movement of the data loot token. The wording seems to imply that you cannot transfer it to the caster. Situational power but useful for a quicker win. The power called Data Knock unlocks a data loot container. The advantage is that you can do it with a line of sight, the downside it is a bit harder to activate. It has one strain and I guess this is situational as well. At first glance this seems meh. Data Skip is similar to Data Jump, it moves a data loot token, but you can target enemy figures and move the loot a smaller distance. Picking up a loot token takes an action and you need to move there as well, which is another action. This means if this power is successful you trade one action for two. It is a good trade-off in a game with action economy. It's a bit difficult to activate and also has two strain though. The next power is destroy weapon. Pretty much a your character is invalid against a specialist. If you succeed that is. Of course it is pricey to use with an activation number of 12 and two strain. Also armor interference. I would absolutely take this, although it is a bit higher risk. Also remember that you only need to pay the strain cost if the power is successful. Coming up, a power called drone. You create a drone that you can use for line of sight, basically a mid shield that can act as a proxy for casting. The drone itself is pretty weak, but your opponent still needs to spend some actions to actually destroy it. The power has one strain which seems like a fair trade. Electromagnetic pulse. Either you can make a robot roll a pretty high wheel check, and if fails it loses its next turn. Or you can jam a weapon of a non-robotic figure and give it minus one damage. With an activation of 10 and one strain this seems pretty good, especially if you're against robots. Anything that takes away agency from your opponent is generally a powerful tool. Energy shield. This gives you three points of ablative armor against the next shooting attack. It has no strain and it is not clear if you can stack this. If you can indeed stack it, it seems good as it costs nothing. If you can't, then honestly 3 damage absorption is nice, but it doesn't scale later in the game. Either way, you can only use it on the caster. Fling. You can yeet a nearby friendly mini 6 inches away in any direction, including up. Or you can do the same with an enemy that you are in combat with, but only horizontally. Either case, the unfortunate yeet is stunned. It is easy to activate, but the combat requirement makes it a bit situational. Also it has strain. However, fall damage and hazardous scenario elements are a thing in Stargrave, so for a frontline character I can see this being regularly useful. Coming up a power called Fortune. If successful gives a figure a fortune token which is a free reroll. Unfortunately you cannot use it to reroll an activation. Since it has no strain I would definitely say this is a very good power. You can buff up your whole team, though they can only have one token at a time. Haggle is an interesting out of combat power. If successful gives you a 20% extra on selling price of trade goods. Obviously it is only useful in campaign play but it is free to use. And even when given to a first mate as a non-core power it will succeed 30% of the time. Even that means a 6% long term average income increase. You can only use it on one item per battle. Honestly I'm having a hard time evaluating this. I would say if you are unsure what powers to take it is a solid choice. Next up heal. Heals any character 5 hit points. It has no strain though it has armor interference and doesn't work on robots. Honestly, this seems like an auto pick. There are very few ways you can heal in this game and with most powers having strain, health loss is a given. Holographic wall. This creates a large wall that blocks line of sight but you can walk through it. This appears on a roll of 1 to 4 at the start of each turn. I assume this is a d20 because nowhere else is a d6 mentioned. This power has one strain but probably saves you more than one health if you don't get shot. I would rate this pretty good out of 10. Life reach with an L, E, A. 
well, this is an undeniably British game. You can steal three heads from a figure. This is pretty good, though the figure gets to roll against it. Funnily enough, you can use this on friendly minis, but that soldier will immediately leave your crew and will count as uncontrolled. First of all, lol. Second, no one will miss Jürgen the recruit who is half dead anyway. This doesn't work on robots and has armor interference, but as with any healing, still pretty great. Lift. This is similar to fling, but with your own crew. You can move a mini 6 inches and you can drop it even without damage. The mini loses its actions this turn, but not in the next one. It also keeps carrying loot tokens. This power has no strain, making it a pretty solid choice for objective rushing. It does have armor interference, which is honestly whatever. You can also just remove your figure from combat with this, so I think this is one of the better powers. Mystic Trance is an out-of-game power that is easy to activate and has no strain. It allows you to attempt one power before the game, though not ones that target the table or the enemy. This makes it essentially a free buff attempt. You can also place a drone with this. Seems like a pretty solid choice. I'm not sure it is intentional, but it specifies that you can't target enemy figures, but it doesn't prohibit targeting unaligned ones, possibly giving you an edge with controlling a neutral creature. Power Spike. Your next shot with a pistol, shotgun or carbine will deal extra damage. The problem with this that I think generally you want to activate a power with your captain or first mate instead of shooting. It also says the next time you make a shooting attack, not the next time you actually hit. It also excludes rapid fire, flamethrower and grenade attacks. Without strain it would be ok in my book or if you could buff other crew members. Currently I would just skip. Psionic Fire. You get to place two non-overlapping flamethrower templates that have a plus 3 bonus. A model will only suffer one attack even if it is hit by two templates. Even with one strain and armor interference this can be pretty red and have a large damage potential. Pull. This is pretty much the version of lift where you can target enemy models. It is harder to do and has strain to reflect this. You can also cause fall damage with this. Seems good for controlling engagements, though the higher activation number means it is less reliable. I would evaluate this as a power more useful later in the campaign. Puppet Master. You can return a crew member that's been out of action to the table with one hit point. The power has a difficulty of 12 to activate and cost 2 strain and has armor interference and the soldier can only be returned once, but even with this restrictions this is a power with immense potential. This power is quite good by itself, but if you have access to healing it becomes extremely good. It doesn't work on robots though. Side note for cheese enthusiasts. Loot tokens are dropped on death, so you can teleport your loot carrier across the board with this. Next, Psychic Shield. Gives you a shield that halves the damage of the next shooting attack, but only works once can be combined with energy shield. The wording kind of suggests here that energy shield is not stackable, but I'm still not sure. This power has two strain and armor interference, so if the next damage would be four or more, it is worth it. It is also cancelled if you get into close combat. With all this, this makes it mid-tier in my book. Use it if you have access to healing, sparingly otherwise. Regenerate. No strain, easy to activate, but you can only heal the caster. And only three hit points. Honestly, I don't see why I would take this over heal. Heal is only slightly harder to activate and you can use it on anyone. The easier activation is literally the only upside, but it just seems outclassed. If you could use two different powers in one turn, maybe I would take this. Coming up, Remote Guidance. An out of game power that lets you activate the robot within the same phase, even if it isn't nearby. I would say this is quite good, giving you a good tactical advantage. It has no strain, so the worst that can happen is nothing. After this, the robot will always activate in the same phase. You can also use this power out of game. It is subject to a one robot at a time limit. Solid choice. Remote firing. You can fire with a robot that is in line of sight at a target within 12 inches. This doesn't cause the robot its turn and it can activate again later. This pairs well with remote guidance. I would use a robot with a flamethrower to send in earlier than use the remote firing to cover the enemy with a template. This is again something offering tactical flexibility, which is my favorite as you might know by now. The power called repair robot, well, it heals a robot within 6 inches. This seems to be the only way in the game to heal robots. So if you are gonna have robots in your team, you should probably take this. Next is Restructure Body. Gives you a trait such as immunity to toxins or being wounded. You can use it out of game and you can change the immunity type in the game. You can't have both at the same time though. Sounds pretty dope as you can never be sure how the game evolves. Also your characters cannot be robots, so this is the only way you can get immunity to being wounded. Quick step. 
the caster can take a 4 inch move without penalties and without triggering attacks on itself. You can also exit combat with it. It is pretty much an oh shit button, depending on your playstyle it could be a good backup. It has one strain so you can't just escape combat with your last hit point. Revive Robot. It can be used both in and out of game. It buffs your robot's shoot, fight and armor stats but reduces its will. Since pretty much all anti-robot powers require a will roll from the target, this makes it more vulnerable. This seems like a good trade-off with no strain, although a little bit high risk, high reward. Also the activation is a bit high. I think this is a power that shines later in the campaign. If you plan to play robot heavy, you should probably still take it. Next up we have suggestion. You can make a target make a will check and if it fails, you can make it drop loot and move 3 inches. It has strain and armor interference making it pretty meh, Hindering your enemy from securing loot is good, but maybe there are better ways. Target designation. Buffs a figure to better evade shooting attacks for the rest of the game. No strain, low activation number, what's not to like. Honestly the only problem with this and with all buff type powers that you will almost never have enough terms to hand them out to everyone. Target lock. The activator or a friendly figure that is close enough can make a free grenade attack that automatically hits. It costs one strain and the use of your power, so I'd rather just try to shoot with my grenadier and use a different power. Next up, it's temporary upgrade. Gives you a bonus to your stats, but it is self only. It has no strain and the free buff is always nice. I'd use this if you want your captain slash exo to actively fight or shoot, otherwise maybe skip. Toxic close. For one strain you get a pretty good melee weapon that is also toxic. Toxin is pretty powerful as it reduces a figure to one action. Also this is the first instance of being able Able to cause toxic damage, so if you plan your character to be in a melee a lot, you should probably pick this. Toxic Secretion It is an out of game action and you can give up to two members of your crew toxic attacks even for ranged weapons. This is really good, the downside is that you can attempt it only once. Transport You can move a friendly figure within 12 inches and line of sight 6 inches away in any direction, but it drops a loot token if it carries it. It has greater range than lift but has strain. The loot token drop also limits its usefulness, I'm rating it kind of meh. Maybe you can rescue a specialist from melee with it. Void Blade Enhances a hand weapon you carry to deal more damage and gives a bonus against shooting versus non template weapons. I should note that Toxic Claws count as hand weapons. I don't see any rule prohibiting combining the two powers. You do lose the Void Blade if you get stunned. You also cannot use larger weapons, but there is a chance you don't really want to in the first place. This seems really good for a melee character, especially that it has no strain. And last, Wall of Force. Creates an impenetrable, unclimbable wall that doesn't block line of sight. It remains where it is placed unless a shooting attack roll of a 19 or a 20 is made against it. Only grenades can be lobbed over it. Situational but pretty annoying in the right circumstance. Blocking your enemy out is quite good and you can cut an escape route with it as well. You can also place multiple walls so yeah, barely out of 10. Well, that was a long and exhaustive list and this is just theory crafting. I imagine the powers will cause a lot of emergent gameplay moments. As a summary, I think there are a few outliers but nothing flat out useless or overpowered. Considering the archetypes, it is a pretty thematic selection too. After the powers chapter, we get some scenarios to play. A book recommends playing a few just as a skirmish game, then moving on to a campaign. I feel the whole system is geared towards progression and some powers, as mentioned before, only make sense in campaign play. The book encourages you to create your own scenarios and not to worry too much about the setting. It is a narrative frame, not a strict rule set. There are 10 scenarios in this chapter, which is a good amount. I spare you the details here, but most of them have some special rules, mechanics or other extra factors, which keeps the gameplay interesting. It tries really hard to avoid to put your minis on a kitchen table and pew pew type engagements. After the scenarios chapter there is the best theory, which is pretty much what you would expect. Scary alien monsters, drones, deep space accountants and other monstrosities. Along with their special rules. There are also rules for random encounters, basically you get one or a few creatures showing up during matches. I would recommend using this out of the box. Not only it gives another tactical layer, but it is a great excuse for boarding more models. Similarly, there is the unwanted attention chart, which gives you a chance for pirates to show up who are really not happy about you nosing around. Whether or not to use this table is a choice of flavor. They are a neutral third party, so neither player gets an advantage here. Obviously, this makes the games longer too. And this concludes the main part of the book. There is still an appendix with crew sheets, printable templates and cards for the various powers, along with a few quick reference pages. 
And now for the grand summary. The Stargrave book is very well put together, cleanly worded and with a simple but pleasant style and font choice. The illustrations are honestly great and evoke the rugged, ravaged galaxy feel. It tries really hard to lower the barrier of entry on every level. There is no required modern range or pushing of merch. Improvising is encouraged along with creativity regarding the rules and scenarios. The one and only slightly rarer thing required is a d20, but in this day and age that's not really a high barrier. Everything you need to play, along with templates and quick reference charts, are in the book. The rules are simple and straightforward. I really tried to spot some exploits, but all I got was some ambiguousness in small matters. Often I was thinking about a conflicting situation, only to find an explanation resolving the exact issue a page later. Rules are often clarified, worded consistently, and even interactions between them cleared up. Speaking of the rules, with a relatively simple set of attributes, the book manages to build up a rather deep system, which is by no means hard to learn. Stargrave reads like a labor of love, and it most likely is, as there is one author listed on the cover. I would love a bit more variation with the soldiers and the weapons, my sniper badly needs a sniper rifle. Also there are pictures of soldiers with rocket launchers, and there is no rocket launcher in the game, what a travesty. I could totally envision an expansion with some extra weaponry to upgrade the game to a full fledged war crime simulator. I should also mention that the author of the game has a blog, of which the link will be in the description. And now, some questions. Is it worth a buy? Well, I bought the PDF version for 10 euros and for that price it was well worth it. The paperback is a bit more expensive I think and I buy that too if I had the space. Otherwise it depends on your financial situation, don't sell your last meal goat for it. It is a good amount of value for the price. How long is a game session? I think it meant to be around one hour. It will take more time if you include extra encounters or drink the bottle of vodka I mentioned. How strong is the community around the game? I have no idea, I haven't looked into it yet. War games tend to have a slow spread, so check around your FLGS. And for a question that will surely pop up in the comments if I don't address it. Will this convert Warhammer 40k players? The answer is, it probably won't. First of all, despite what you might feel reading comments on the internet, you are allowed to like and play multiple games and Stargrave is a low investment game. You can even play it with your existing Warhammer minis, it is not illegal or anything. Second, I don't think the intended audience is veteran or jaded war gamers, or any subset of them that are yet leaving again forever because GW nerfed their army. I do believe this book will turn a lot of tabletop RPG gamers into wargaming or serve as a gateway drug to plastic crack addiction. It is a lightweight, easy to get into system with a few restrictions and no heavy piles of lore stacked behind it. Lore however is a big selling point of Warhammer with thousands of nerds arguing over typos written over 30 years ago. In contrast, Stargrave is a generic sci-fi setting, it is very much what you make of it. It is also written by one person, not a dedicated and experienced team of writers on minimum wage. And with this, we have come to the end of the video. Reading and reviewing Stargrave was a great experience and I can heartily recommend it. If you were even mildly entertained by this review, consider giving this video a like and subscribe to feed the algorithm. If you didn't, don't forget to leave some incoherent rambling in the comment section. See you next time.